Thank you, Laura. And thanks for everybody coming today and for having me. Um, it's a nice opportunity to present and to talk about um, my field because I think it's, uh, it's an area that might interest a lot of you and you might not really know about it. And you might have the skills that you need to go into it. And it's a, it's a fun field. There's lots of jobs to be had. The, um, the pay's good. It's a lot of variety. So uh, that's what I'm here to talk about is uh, what we call branding. And I'll talk a little bit about me and what I do um, and just kind of talk about the discipline of branding and what it is, who does it, what kind of roles are there within branding, and sort of like a so what. What, you know, what does it matter? What does it do? How does it affect our world? So anyway, I am a brand strategist for Toki Branding and Design. And we are St. Louis's largest and most awarded branding and design firm, and we have won over 400 international, national, uh, regional, and local awards. And you know that's a that's a pretty nice track record. So we're very proud of that. Um, and they range anywhere from graphics to the Webbies. So we have a big department of web designers and web developers, uh, as well as uh, print um, designers and writers and strategists like myself. Honkyat.com called us uh, the top 50 or one of the top 50 worldwide trend-setting design studios. And we have clients all over the nation, including a couple here in Dallas. So what we do is we are a branding company and we build brands all across every media. So it could be the web, it could be social media, it could be radio, it could be TV, it could be print. So uh, we like to create messaging and strategy behind a brand and then put it out to wherever it needs to be. So wherever the target markets are for that, um, for that brand, we'll, we'll be active in that media. So what we do is first we create the strategy and the messaging um, we then create the brand identity and any collateral materials that are needed. We work in web and social media oftentimes. We also create wayfinding signage for places like universities or art museums. And then we do video and photography as well. So you can see there's a lot of different disciplines within marketing communication. So if you love photography, or if you are an artist, or if you are a writer, or if you are a combination of both, there's something for you to do in branding. So what is it? Well, the definition has changed. It sort of began as a discipline in the 60s, and back then, uh, and still a little bit to this day, the, uh, the AMA, the American Marketing Association, kind of defines it as the brand mark or the logo, the icon of what a brand stands for. Um, and that identifies it to its customers. But we really feel like it's way bigger than that. And classic branding, starting back in the 60s, uh, they thought in terms of mass media, and that would be like a TV commercial or a print ad, some sort of a catchy slogan. One of the most classic uh, and most awarded ads from back then is Alka-Seltzer. And their big thing was, you know, it even became a slogan, plap, plap, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. So that doesn't really tell you much about the product. It doesn't really say why, what is the purpose of the brand, but it's catchy, you remember it. You know, it's kind of fun. It talks about what the product does. But, you know, beyond that, it's like, OK. Um, so now things have changed. And branding and marketing is no longer really about that catchy slogan or phrase uh, or the cute commercial. We talk about why a brand exists. What is the purpose of the brand? What is the purpose that this brand exists? And so then modern brands use a collection of what we call brand assets to have meaningful relationships with their target audience. So it goes way beyond the slogan, way beyond just the brand mark or the icon to do that communicating. So here's a little bit about how Alka-Seltzer has evolved their advertising. 
So they're no longer using plap, plap, fizz, fizz. They're telling you about the purpose of their product. So the purpose is I ate a chile and I need an El Salvador. So it tells you that when you eat spicy foods, you can be saved by Alka-Seltzer. This diagram is called the Golden Circle, and it's been created by a guy by the name of Simon Sinek. And he really pioneered this concept of start with why. Why does the brand exist? Why does your service exist? And back in the 60s, it was the reverse of this. So brands always talked about what it was they did, how they did it, and then they finally got to the why. Well, now it's the reverse of that, and we start with why, because we feel that that has the most meaning to everybody. And yes, you can explain how you do that and what you do, but you really want to start with why. So Toki created this stair-step diagram, and we call it the strategic brand. This is how we build our strategic brands. So we start with the overall brand strategy and the purpose of the brand. So we ask questions like, why does this exist? Who are our target audiences? Who do we want to talk to in social media? Who do we want to buy our product? Who do we want to read our ad in the newspaper or our magazine? And what kind of a relationship do we want to have with them? Do we want to sell a car that somebody only buys once every 15 years? Or are we selling socks that somebody needs to buy you know, five times a year or something like that? So that helps us create this base of who the brand is. Then we get to the art involved, so the brand identity. And really, that distills in a visual way who we are, who the brand is. So an artist will create the logo, and artists and writers together create the brand promise. And from there, the communication materials are created. So any print ad or brochure or something like that, advertising comes after that, and then the website and social media, public relations, and then it all builds into the highest brand awareness that we can bring to any of our clients. So what roles do artists and designers play in all of this? The biggest part is creating what we call the signature style of a brand. And that involves everything from designing the logo to picking the typeface that reflects the personality of the brand. It's picking the colors that are associated. It's deciding, is this brand reflected by illustration? Photography, is that photography black and white? Is it nice warm color? Is it kids, is it adults, you know, what is it? So artists play a very, very important role in this particular step, but in many steps along the way as well. So you can see that creating that signature style that artists are very, very critical to is, is this point number two. So I come at this from a writing background. I've been a writer, producer uh, all of my career. I still do that, but now I help develop brand strategy. But all throughout my career, I have always worked with artists and designers. Sometimes it can be you know, a partnership of two. Sometimes it's several writers and several artists working together. Sometimes it's a whole team of people. Um, but, you know, there's a really nice relationship that happens between writers and artists because we're involved in all of these steps along the way together. And sometimes there are artists who can also write well. And, um, you know, that's kind of the double whammy. I mean, they've got it all. They can really um, be successful. So... Here are sort of the steps along the way that, um, you know, kind of to show you where artists are really involved. So 
Strategy is kind of where I live, you know, and where most writers would live. So what we do is we do the competitive analysis. We study other services or products out there that are similar to the one we're working on. We look at the best practices of those other companies and services. How are they successful? What are they doing right? And what can we learn from them? And then we create that brand purpose that's going to live with the brand throughout its life. And on the web side, um, we and artists and developers work together to create the information architecture that is going to be produced through the website. We create the positioning and the messaging and then work on that content strategy. What are the stories that a brand is going to share by way of social media with their audience. And then the designers take over. So they create the brand identity, the brand look and feel, or that distinctive signature style. They are involved with the photography, with web design, infographics on the web, uh, work with writers to create advertising and marketing collateral, and then through the development phase where we would get really involved in uh, the website and social media, there's more kinds of technical people involved in the creative process. And then that goes on through public relations and employee communications. So once we have this bedrock of the brand and we know what the signature style is, what we all, the artists and the writers working together, have to inform. So all of our materials will inform our audience. We want to promote the product. And then we launch that product and start to have our relationship and engagement with our audience. So just to show you some examples of, you know, what does this really mean in the real world? So let's get away from the theory and show you some actual examples of some brand marks that Toki has created. So starting up here on the upper right, uh, this is actually a, a Texas-based company called Tandis Flooring. And this was a division of their company that they wanted to express that they were a united group that you could buy different kinds of flooring. So you can see that the icon, the mark of the brand, is something that is interrelated. So that showed in a physical, graphic way this connection of this group within Tandis Flooring. And then you can see that the brand mark is actually made up of wood and color that you could get through other materials of the flooring. Solutia on the upper left uh, had been a national company that made chemicals. And they wanted to expand and go global. And they were starting to get involved in the manufacture of other things like um, window films and airplane tires and you know just all kinds of a variety of things that were really not related very much. So we created this brand mark that shows the global nature now of the company. And those, all those little different lines are meant to represent all of the different facets of their company. Art the Vote on the bottom left uh, was a, uh, an effort to um, get people to um, register to vote. So it was a series of billboards that uh, were given to artists. They could create their own billboard, um, but it was all about getting people excited about the voting process through artwork. So uh, this represents you know, the, the kind of coming together of art and politics. Thinking Cap is a company that does marketing research and consulting. We did this uh, logo for Facebook Intelligence, which is a division of Facebook that is sort of a marketing research division. And so it's all about being very cerebral and thinking about how uh, companies can reach their audience. So this is a nice representation of that. This here, um, you 
may know the trumpeter uh, jazz musician now past, but his name is Miles Davis, and that is a very, very famous photograph of Miles. And so he had this way of playing that, you know, his whole body got into it. And so the artist who designed this logo for this festival put her graphics inside this uh, silhouette of Miles Davis. So instantly, anybody who knew Miles Davis knew what that was. They knew that it inv involved jazz, they knew it involved Miles Davis, and that's a very successful logo. Very, very simple, but in a graphic way, it tells you exactly what you need to know. And I'll bet you can all guess what that restaurant serves. So HOK is a global architecture firm. And they have offices, just a lot, a lot of different offices all over the place. And um, one division will design art museums. The next one will design um, hospitals. Another will design schools. Another will design theme parks like Six Flags. So they got to the point where all of these different divisions were very, very successful. But they were saying, look, you know, Art museums have nothing to do with theme parks, so I'm going to go off and I'm going to design my own look and feel to my brochure because it has nothing to do with those guys. Yeah, we all work for the same company, but who cares? You know, they do different things. I want to stand out. I want to be, you know, I want to speak to who I am and what I do and the kinds of buildings that we design. So what that ended up happening was uh, they were becoming too splintered. And what we call it is um, they became a house of brands. And what we wanted to do was create a look where, whoops, where all of these different offices could have materials that represented what they do. But what we wanted to build was a branded house. So the re reverse of a house of brands, we were creating a branded house. And what that means is that we, first of all, what we did was we refreshed the logo to make them look, look younger and, and more edgy, which is what they wanted to do. The artist came up with a primary set of colors. So the orange, the gray, the black, were going to stand for the HOK brand. But since they had all these other divisions, the artist needed to create a whole palette of secondary colors so that they could each create materials, but were still within that family of colors that had been established. So you could see, this is a pretty big palette. Normally, we wouldn't develop a palette that had that many secondary colors, but because we were dealing with a global brand that had lots and lots of different divisions, we wanted to give them the most flexibility that we could. So this is how that look, that clean, fresh, edgy sort of look manifested itself in the business card. So there, we created this look that was a lot of white space, coupled with punchy color, but letting the work speak for itself. So in this case, the punch comes from the color on the back of the card, and then on the front, it's very, very clean, lots and lots of white space. That look also lives on in the website. So we created this look where we would let the work speak for itself by way of large imagery, professionally shot photos of the work that they had designed. But you see all this white space. And their logo doesn't honk off the page. It's very subtle. It's still orange, but it's up in the uh, upper corner, not really interfering with the work at all. And this is a, a set of brochures, so you can see how, again, the white space is being used, the large imagery is being used, and again, letting it speak for itself. Here is a, a sample of some of those divisions that I was talking about. So everybody gets to look different, 
you know, they all can pick their own photos, but what the artist decided was is here's all this white space, okay, leave that alone, pick a photo, you know, that is color and simple, but make it, stretch it across the page. So it is the main image on the page. So even the brochures kind of mimic the website because the website has, have these large, large images. Well, the, the print collateral materials mimic that style. So you can see that everybody gets to have their own look, and yet at the same time, it's a very cohesive look. Moving on to the University of Chicago, they have uh, some of the best doctors in the world working at the medical center there. And, but they, they were coming off as being cool and aloof. And there's a lot of competition for healthcare in the Chicago market. And they were leaving the patients out of the story. But you know, when you're sick, you want to think that somebody's taking care of you. You want to um, have your doctor really focus on you. So the patients were somehow being left out of the University of Chicago medicine story. So this is something you know, that I would get involved with. I did you know, marketing research to begin with. And then sometimes I will actually plot out on a graph the taglines of the competitors. And so on this side of the chart, it's a real emphasis on the physicians and the hospital itself and you know, kind of the place and the geniuses. And over here would be the emphasis is mainly on the patient. And so we saw that really only one of their competitors was even remotely talking about the patient at all, and that was Cleveland Clinic. And they state, every life deserves world-class care. The University of Chicago told us they did not want to change their tagline. It had been established in the 90s. They didn't want to change it. And their tagline is, at the forefront of medicine. It's a good tagline, but again, it focuses on them, you know, at the forefront of medicine, you know, where are these geniuses? But where's the patient in that story at all? So what we did was we created new brand promises for them, and brand promises are typically something that are used internally, but it's that rah-rah statement that everybody gets behind, and then the agency uses to create the advertising or the content that goes along with Forefront of Medicine, but it starts to be able to tell the story of the patient a little bit more. And this is how that change starts to reflect itself in the work that artists and writers do. So this is an example of a print ad, and these are actual people. So this is a patient. Notice the patient is in the forefront of the photograph, and the doctor is in the background. The doctor is in a supporting role to the patient who is of primary importance. They used to have it the reverse of that, like I am the king of doctors, and now this is much more about how can we help this guy. So uh, the other decision that an artist would make in this case is, well, why do they use black and white photography? Most people are used to nice warm color, you know, it's very pretty to look at, and, but here it's a different look. Again, that came from studying the competition. We looked at the competition and saw that everybody was using color imagery. So a way to stand out in a very cluttered marketplace is look different. So we hired a very, very good and very famous photographer to work with us to create this imagery. And you can see the, you know, the lighting is, is very, very uh, um, uh, e emotional and evocative. And the colors, even though it's you know, a black and gray scale, are very, very saturated. Here's how it even looks with children. So we're still able to bring that youthfulness, but again, the patient is first and foremost. And then these are magazine covers uh, that we created. So you can see that that look 
is being extended throughout all of the brand assets. So the website has a similar look. The brochures have a similar look. So that color of maroon is their brand color. These are the fonts. And the style of photography is always black and white and very, very large on the page. Brown School of Social Work is a part of Washington University in St. Louis. So, you know, St. Louis is in the middle of the country, but they wanted to communicate that even though you're in the middle of the country, you're not stuck there. We teach people about serving people all over the world. So, in fact, the students who uh, go to Brown School of Social Work really don't spend very much time in St. Louis at all. So, in the view book and in the other marketing collateral that we created for them, we wanted to show the possibility. We wanted to show what can be done. How can I have a social impact? So these are the magazines that we created for Brown School. And within these materials, as well as on their website, we focus on what do the students do when they're actually doing their thing. Well, you can see in this headline, we talk about being abroad. And in all of the photography, it's always showing students not in class, not in lecture, not walking around the campus, they're somewhere all across the world helping people. So even though you're going to St. Louis, you're not going to be in St. Louis very much. We show the diversity of the students. We talk about their different stories. Show them in action wherever their work takes them. And yes, we do talk a little bit about St. Louis. I mean, St. Louis isn't bad. Um, you know, so we want people to get to know the city that they're going to live in, but that's not first and foremost. This is almost like, you know, the secondary story. The first story is where can you go and what can you do? The core of discovery is uh, a name that we created for an area in downtown St. Louis that is... Um, really primarily all about tourism. So it's a destination district, and it's anchored by the arch. But what we found was uh, that most tourists were coming to St. Louis. They were only going to the arch and maybe to a Cardinals game, and then they'd head out and leave. Well, there's a lot more to be discovered. And so you probably all know that Lewis and Clark came through St. Louis back in the day, and they were called the core as well. So we created this little combo uh, of core of discovery so that modern day tourists could sort of be like Lewis and Clark of back in the day. So you can see that all of these, there's a lot of things to do in this area of St. Louis and it's really very close to one another, but people were choosing to really only go here, go to the Cardinals and go. So they didn't even know that these other things existed. So what the artist did was, once we came up with that name, Core of Discovery, and created that basic logo, they created this series of other logos, related logos, that told the audience quickly, this is all related. So they all have that sort of medallion shape. They all use the same font. Um, and they use that palette of bright, punchy colors. So it immediately tells somebody, oh, okay, I could take a cruise, I could go to see some art, I could learn about history, I could go rent a bike, I could do all this stuff. And it's all related to the core of discovery. And here's how it looks in an outdoor board. And then the other thing that an artist has to do is think about how is my artwork going to be used? What what formats do I have to worry about? So yeah, you know, it's going to be on the website, so you need to you know, think about that. And more than likely, it's going to be on you know, a piece of paper somehow, a flat piece. But a lot of times, it's more than that. So here, it's all about how can I convey this visual idea in a really cool bag, on a really cool bag. Here it is on t-shirts. We also used it in events. 
So artists will also be involved with, okay, we're going to have this great big event. This is the uh, courthouse of St. Louis, the old courthouse of St. Louis. How can we make this a really fun event and utilize our artwork? Well, an artist said, well, why don't we just project it huge on a building? So those are some of the you know, interesting things that, that you could be involved with. We also create web apps. So these are used by people coming into St. Louis, and they can quickly look up where they want to go, how far something is, can they make reservations at a restaurant, and things like that. This is an interactive display that would be in lobbies of places in that area so that you could pop in and find out where you are, how far it would take you to, you know, to walk to the next destination. So again, artists are involved in all of these things. So does branding have an impact, do you think? You know, does it have, does it play a big role in our daily lives? Well, since this is a class, you have to have a quiz. So I'm going to see how many companies you can identify if I just tell you the industry that they're in and the color they're associated with, or colors. See how good you do. Yeah. So some artist somewhere along the line back in the what, late 50s, early 60s, decided McDonald's was going to be presented with red and yellow. It's still around to this day. Now, they may have tweaked the arches. They refresh it every once in a while. But those colors live on. Exactly. They even call it Big Blue just because IBM is such a, a mega company. But they're associated with blue and that particular shade of blue. Coke, exactly. Pepsi is blue in the soft drink world. Yep. Starbucks. Exactly. Who's, who's got the copper top? Yeah, exactly. Duracell. MasterCard. So you see how it, it's permeating our brains, you know? I mean, the decisions that artists make, whether it's the colors that are going to represent a brand, whether it's the font that is chosen to reflect the personality of the brand. You remember the font that was used on Thinking Cap? It was, you know, kind of very, it had a lot of motion, it had a lot of life to it, and that was very different than the a uh, font that was selected for or even created. Sometimes people hand create a font. But for Solutia, Solutia was strong and powerful, very, very different from the personality of the thinking cap. So these, these definitely um, are things that maybe don't come to mind, you know, that we don't think about uh, very much. But when you sit down and think, Oh, yeah, branding does have an impact in my world, and it's very ubiquitous. It's everywhere, and we just don't even really notice it. There's a great film. If you guys haven't seen it, I think you can get it on Netflix. It's called Helvetica. It's about the font, and it's about the gentleman who created the font. And it is probably one of the most basic fonts in the world. It's you know, it got to the point where people were bored with it and refused to use it. But the, the movie, if you have a chance to get it, really do get it. It's a very, very interesting piece because it talks about how it's everywhere. You start looking around and you see it all over the place. So that is a good example of a font that appeals to a lot of different people. It can apply in a lot of different circumstances to represent a lot of things, whereas other fonts are very, very specific in their personality. So that's my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Sure. Way that doesn't continue that, that focus. 
So great question because people always want to do that. They always want to water down their own brand and they don't even realize they're doing it. So what we do is we create what are called brand standards and that's usually put together in you know, a, it could be on a website, like a microsite part of their website so that all of their employees can access it. Um, it could be put together in a book or a PDF. So it's that, um, you know, if anybody needs to create any materials, they can always refer back to that. But there always has to be sort of a, um, you know, a, an entity within the company that reviews all of that stuff so that there isn't anything getting out that doesn't conform to the brand standards. Yes? I'm kind of interested in the relationship between branding and advertising. I can see it as both kind of a synergy in helping each other and also competitive. Absolutely. So most branding uh, agencies began as advertising agencies. And it became when that focus shifted that I talked about from what do we do to why we do it um, and away from the catchy slogan as being the first thing that you think of with a brand, that's when agencies started thinking more about, you know what, we want to be involved in the creation of the brand and then we can be involved in all the permutations of that brand. So we can create the advertising, we can create the website, we can do all of those things. Whereas before it was really just that limited, okay, I'm just the ad guy. I'm just you know creating the TV spot, I'm just creating the print ad, and that was kind of where that role stopped. And so branding is a way to get those same types of people involved in more aspects of the brand and really the whole story of the brand. And if you guys are ever looking for who are some of the other agencies around the country as you start to think about where might I work, uh, besides Toki in St. Louis, um, there are a couple, uh, there are more than a couple, but two come to mind in Texas that are really very, very good. Richards, of course, is the famous one. And then there's one in Austin, I want to say it's called GMSD or something like that. I have it written down somewhere. GS, yeah, that's it. Um, they're very good and very famous. Frog, I think, is in Texas. Um, the granddaddy of them all is called Landor, uh, and they have offices all over the world. Um, Arnell is another one. Now, Arnell is an interesting case. They're a branding agency based in New York City. And you might have noticed that the Pepsi logo changed a few years ago and the can graphic changed. Well, Arnell did that. That's a huge, huge deal. But that was a successful refresh of a brand logo, of a brand icon they did the same thing that same year for Tropicana orange juice, and it bombed. I mean, people who buy that product started writing into social media uh, sites just talking about how horrible the change was. They couldn't stand the new graphics, and guess what Tropicana did? They went back to the older way. They, they did some refreshes on their packaging, so it's... You know, you have to maintain consistency of a look, and then when you're ready to do the refresh, you just have to test and test and test and test. You have to talk to your target audiences to really figure out, do people want this? Do they like it? You know, a, a bunch of agency people could sit around and go, yeah, that's great, you know, but what, what difference does that make? It's really the people who buy the product uh, that make all the difference in the world. Let's see, besides uh, those agencies, um, you can typically find an agency, a branding agency, in every major city, um, and they range in size. Uh, there's always um, quite a few artists working at those agencies. I would say primarily it's, it's artists with the secondary group of people being writers and strategists in terms of numbers of people in the agency.
Um, I wanted to write, and I um, so I got my degree in creative writing, and um, I then wanted to. Um, at first, I thought I wanted to get into journalism. And, but then I found that I was going to have to move to some tiny little town in the middle of nowhere to get my foot in the door and then work up to being in like a semi-big city. So that, that wasn't going to work. So I decided to try my hand at marketing communications and really loved it because it was a lot of variety and I love variety. Um, and I was able to work in a lot of different formats, so print and video and radio and TV, and that was really fun for me, and working with artists one-on-one -on -one, uh, was really great. So, um, so for a lot of people, uh, I think that's a good way in. Uh, some people enter in with a marketing degree. The artists, for the most part, um, will either get communication design type degrees, but there are a lot of people that start off in fine art and then, as I call it, move to the dark side. Because, um, you know, let's face it, you know, fine art is great and all, you know, no offense to my friend over here who is a brilliant fine artist, but it's tough to make a living as a fine artist, you know, so you often have to pay your electric bill and your phone bill, so coming over to the dark side helps you do that. <laughs> Yeah. What does it, it cost to have a logo made for a company or be branded at all? Well, just logo design um, can range anywhere from 5000 to 250000 So it depends on the size of the company and how uh, widespread the logo will go. So we work with companies of all sizes. So if we were going to design a logo for a small not-for-profit company um, and they weren't going to be you know, creating a bunch of TV spots and it was just you know, something that was going to stay very small, we could design something like that for $5,000. Would it be the heavy hitter designers in our agency working on it? No, probably not. You know, probably we would give it to the um, the entry level designers to you know start cutting their teeth on doing a project like that. But then you know, logos really range in price, uh, just depending on the nature of the business and how big it's going to get. Uh huh. Have you or your artists ever found it to be a challenge um, branding for companies that aren't from your part of the world? Yeah, I mean, it is. Uh, so I would say if we were starting to look at something that was so particular to an area of the country, we would actually send people there to hang out. You know, like if we were going to, to um, let's say, do some advertising for a state park in Seattle, and none of us had ever walked those trails, it's incumbent upon us, it would be our responsibility to go there, hike those trails, get a sense of what it's like there, what's around it, what kind of people are there already, what kind of people do they want to attract to those trails, and things like that. So uh, agencies, bigger agencies, have the flexibility of sending people around so that you don't miss out on that information that you really do pick up on a local level. So, but again, you know, if you were going to be working in another country, you know, that would be tough to do unless you went there. So you really do have to get steeped into uh, what's happening right around there. How long does it take, like, uh, for y'all to, like, make a logo from time to time? 
Well, at our place, we would love to have, you know, six months, but we never get that long. I mean, but it is a big process. So the way we typically start the process is, you know, once we know what the assignment is and what the brand personality is, and, you know, once all of that is under our belt, and that could take three months, you know, that whole discovery process, we call it, could take that long. And then the process that we go through to develop the logo would be to first come up with, say, maybe seven to ten in black and white only. Because we want to know, is that successful without the crutch of color? Because all logos, at some point in their lives, will be only one color. It'll be black and white. So, and then we start looking at it big, and then we reduce it down to that size. Because, you know, if you're walking around with a shirt and you've got a logo that's that big on your breast pocket, or if you've got, you know, a little tiny business card or something like that, you have to know, is your mark successful, little, big, black and white? You know, before you even enter into color, is it a successful piece? And then you can go into color exploration and things like that. So, um, you know... Uh, I would say a comfortable time frame would probably be three months or so. It'd be nice to get a little bit more, but sometimes companies just don't have that kind of time. Yes? Yes, we uh, have worked with artists as well as authors. And um, typically what we would do is to um, come up with their style. So are they going to always, again, appear in black and white photography, color photography, creating a logo that represents their personality. And then the branding comes into play with what does the book cover look like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so we've developed um, books for Stephen Perina, and uh, we also do a lot of uh, catalogs for the artists that go through uh, the Pulitzer Foundation for the Arts, Contemporary Art Museum, uh, Lohmeyer Sculpture Park. Um, so yeah, that does come into play a lot. And then uh, at um, the publishers, there are a whole series of artists that work on establishing what does that author look like. So they would do more of that than an agency would, but it does happen. Okay. I just wanted to mention, um, I mean, Natalie's very successful at what she does, but when you learn about her background, she has a, a lot of knowledge and experience in a variety of areas, right? And um, I think it's important for artists to know that the more information they can get about any subject, the better off you will be. So, um, and I think she's a really great example of that. And I will say that when I... Uh, got out of grad school, I had to work as a graphic designer, and I had no business being there. I was not good at it. So, uh, but it was the dark side. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Natalie. You're Thanks, everybody. Thank you.